A very good afternoon, everyone, and very warm welcome to this Net Zero debate hosted by Manufacturing TV uh, with the uh, grateful support of Sage and the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. Um, we have got a huge topic to focus on today. Uh, Net Zero, as we all know, encompasses a vast array of um, topics and subject matters and domains of expertise. We, in our documentary we put out last week, chose to focus more closely on what it means to SME manufacturers rather than the very large macro issues around things like electrification and so on. But inevitably, they will have some kind of input into our conversation today. What came out of the documentary, The Road to Net Zero for manufacturers, you could see that. Um, just find out what it means to your business and your place in the wider value chain. I think that's going to be an incredibly important part of this discussion tonight, because uh, I don't know how value chains can move at the same pace. Um, some people say that SMEs are a lot more agile uh, when it comes to change. But then again, a lot of people also uh, are very well aware that it's the much larger companies who are probably going to have the budgets uh, to help them change. So I really want to get a handle on that one. Um, Undertake an emissions audit, that came out of... Um, uh, the contribution that Kirsty Davis Chinook made to our film, uh, she actually said, how can I start to understand where I've got to go if I don't know where I am? And of course, find out where there is help, because that is absolutely vital. Uh, reach out, get help, don't do this on your own. Um, and when it came to government, ugh, that's rather a lot there. Um, very important, I think Brian Holiday's point um, from Siemens, uh, it was all about fiscal policy. Currently, there's a lot of encouragement for CapEx and patent books, but uh, there isn't so much when it comes to sustainability and also to reward the use of refurbished and secondhand machinery uh, and perhaps materials in capital allowances. That's a huge one because materials, as I know from the high value manufacturing catapult, this is very much part of their strategy. And we're going to ask Sam to, to talk about that. Energy, obvious. Um, uh, in UK Infrastructure Bank, vital. These are very big issues. I'm not certain we can necessarily uh, tackle them today, but I think it's important to note that the UK steel industry is in, I think, a lot of trouble. And Chris McDonald from the uh, Materials Processing Institute uh, said uh, during the course of the film that we could be on the verge of conducting a very unique experiment of being the only advanced manufacturing economy without its own steel industry. And this is very, very important. Uh, standards for carbon taxation. How do you carbon accounting and all of that? So uh, I shall stop the share. Um, number one, uh, Sam, I'm going to come to you, if I may. Um, a warm welcome. Tell us, having had a look at that, do you think there was anything missing? Do you think um, we got anything wrong in those recommendations? What are your thoughts when you when you when you read those? Yeah, hi, Nick. Um, I think they're, they're, they're good recommendations. I think they catch most of the key points. I think the, the, the point you made at the outset around, you know, we need to know where we are before we know how to get where we're trying to get to. I think that understanding and measuring where, where we are now is, is really critical. And the, and the last point around um, carbon accounting is, is really critical for businesses to understand, you know, what is the current footprint, having some standard ways of which we can account for Carbon, not only the scope one and two in our factories, but that in our supply chain as well is crucial. So I think that's a really important point, understanding how to measure where we are, how to compare ourselves with others, also how to be rewarded um, for, for decarbonizing. How can we evidence progress that we make? There is some low hanging fruit, especially with current energy costs around resource and energy efficiency. I think I think that came out in the, in the documentary as well. Um, so there are some quick wins, but to go all the way to start decarbonizing our, our supply chains, our national footprint, there's investment required as well. And to be able to realize that, we need to be able to evidence our, our carbon footprint, evidence that effectively be rewarded by the market somehow for reducing that. That starts with transparency, then that follows up with either market pool or potentially things like carbon pricing. Roger Singleton, you work and have worked for some time now with SMEs on their net zero journeys. Um, I realise that there's not going to be necessarily a common theme coming out of that. Give us a sense of what your experience 
um, of working with them. And I'm assuming they're self-selecting. They're obviously ones who wanted to embark on their net zero journey. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Sorry again. And uh, just following up. And hi, Sam, by the way, as well. Long time no see. <laughs> Sam and I go way back. Um, yeah. In our, in our careers. Um, yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's a good point you raise. Uh, just a bit of backdrop, I think, for some people on the call. I've been working now under a publicly funded program for about 18 months, um, working with both SMEs and, the, and some of the bigger players, largely industrially aligned, um, trying to develop their pathways to net zero. Um, so a lot of the recommendations that you raised um, ring very true. Um, most are extremely surprised, even the bigger players, at just the amount of change that they've got to do within, within the business. Um, the most most approach as well wanting to know their numbers at, at that at that moment in time around their you know co2 emissions um one thing that they quickly seem to come across is that it's very hard to do that out of scope one and two anytime you get into products and services and anything where your you know your product is going downstream uh that quickly has to get into a much deeper exercise and um it's not not as easy to do on that line so i'm always a bit um i think you can give them estimates and ballparks of, of where they sit and in terms of that um but uh, i think it's you know that's just the start of the journey for them what one thing that i do think was missing um from that list and it's something that i've come across not just in the net zero domain but when i've looked at other kind of big movements and um, sort of that have been desired from industry around innovation and digital is capabilities really so i, I can talk all all day about um value chain and the impact of product downstream but a, a lot of the smes i come to they, they have very limited procurement staff that they're already overloaded just chasing invoices how do you even get them starting to categorize their vendors you know how do you incorporate any kind of esg kpis into that or even just carbon as a as a first off and and also most of them they don't have any kind of um yeah not not really any formalized product design management process either so you you've almost got to establish some of that base layer capability even before you start thinking about environmentally informed design so I, I, I spend most of the time with my method actually talking about capabilities rather than numbers around CO2. So I, I think we have to start thinking about how to change their operations moving forward so that they're operating in a different way and into the future. Uh, thanks, Roger. Yeah, we'll come back to some of that. Um, I forgot, typical me, um, didn't introduce Johnny. Everybody will know Johnny, of course, uh, my old partner in crime from... Uh, days of yore. Um, Johnny's going to be asking questions as well and contributing to that. And Johnny, I think you introduced me first of all to Kirsty. Is that not true? Yeah, um, through through um, some work I've been doing with the Maid, the Maid group, which encompasses Made in Yorkshire and Made in the Midlands. So yeah, I saw Kirsty at one of their events um, and was just impressed with the way that she was approaching sustainability with her, with her business. Um, and then obviously the news story came out about the the carbon calculator um, and the work she's done partnering with a university. Um, one of the recommendations that came out was around collaboration. Um, and I was wondering if I could go to Kirsty, please, to just explain a little bit of how that interaction developed. Did you go out and approach the university? Did they approach you? And also, I suppose, did you have a firm idea of what it is you wanted to get out of that relationship? And was that a a benefit or do you think that was maybe a hindrance even? The journey started for us probably about 18 months ago um, and I'm pretty sure um, that I was talking to um, Lorelai, um, uh, one of the doctors um, at University of Birmingham and, and was expressing frustration that I couldn't um, find a, a, a checklist online. We go online to do everything and I wanted to go and find a nice list of 10 items that I could tick off each one and implement them and then go, 
oh, look, I've achieved net zero. And of course, that doesn't exist. So I thought, I'll, I'll find a carbon calculator. And I couldn't find one online. Um, and I'd done another project with Birmingham and I was having a catch up with Lorelei and had a bit of a tantrum. And she was like, we can develop one for you. Um, and she says, and we can do it. So it's fully funded. Um, and then we're going to want to look at practical applications. And I said, well, I've got competitors and uh, collaborators within the industry. What if we all banded together? Um, and then you can look at moving it into other arenas, um, such as laser cutting or bending or forming as well. Um, so that's really how it started, was the fact that I couldn't find what I wanted on Google. And I wonder whether or not you have, having gone through that process, and we're encouraging manufacturers to reach out to universities, to catapults, to, to, to whoever. Have you got any advice in terms of how to, how to manage that, how to go about forming those collaborations? For me, it works off having a really big idea, then having the conversation with them and breaking it down what you can easily achieve with what can be funded um, by them through government money or EU money, what's left of it, um, or through catapults. Find out if there can be um, several stages to it. Find out how much investment's going to come from you, whether it's time, whether it's money, and, and literally do a three-point plan. And that way, you're not going to bite off more than you can chew or afford and you're not going to be underwhelmed by having a big plan and then just getting 10% of it done. Um, you need to be very clear in your objectives um, and you need to communicate what those objectives are and why you want to achieve them. Sam, did that resonate with you what uh... Kirsty was saying, it sounds like a brilliant thing that she and Birmingham Uni did, but it did require that sharp focus from her to know exactly what she wanted. Um, it, because there's a lot of help out there, as I said at the beginning, but I wonder um, you know, how people know what to ask for. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kirsty. I think you're very impressed by what uh, you've done there. And I can see clearly that sharp focus helps to deliver the outcome you want. You get what you want, you get it quickly at the right price, hopefully. Um, but I recognize that everybody has that sharp focus. They perhaps have they have an idea of the problem, but not an idea of the solution, which I think you pretty quickly came to, Kirsty. So I, th I think that clearly, you know, that's an ideal way to approach Catapult University and saying, this is what we need. Let's see how, how we can get that delivered in a really focused way. Another thing that we, we can provide, I suppose, is helping to articulate, you know, the, the, the problem is the challenge is simply we know we need to decarbonize we don't know where to start then we can help to direct companies towards you know appropriate next steps or providers externally can help with that but but i think yeah an ideal scenario is coming in as curiously has and said this is what we need as a gap can we develop something that's really focused and delivers what you know is usable um so so i think you can still come and approach and ask for help by saying this is where i am it didn't even be a long project plan but you know what are companies like me doing to address these problems? So we, we can play a role in, in helping to answer, propose the question and helping to connect to others who have solved the problems in a, in a similar way or, or like-minded companies. So yeah, Kirsten's approach is the ideal one, I think, but we, you need to have that really clear focus of exactly what I need to still be able to get help. OK, don't forget, anybody, if you want to ask a question, please just raise your hand or use the uh, hand raise um, device. Um, I will be asking questions and of some of you because John Barrett, do you mind if I ask you a question? Um, because you're very much in sustainable engineering. Tell us what it means to your company and how you've gone about it, because it sounds to me like you're you've you headed down the road to net zero with some speed. Yeah, okay. So uh the sustainable engineering project is essentially brand new, um, kicking off. Uh, really tomorrow, Southern Manufacturing at the exhibition where we're attending to do some research. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of background. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's gone. Uh, I am a, I'm qualified as a product design engineer. 
I've spent most of my life um, also in the industrial publishing industry, um, distributing information about engineering subjects. Um, and also I operate a software development business um, on which we can build um, some of these um, information um, portals. And what interested me uh, a long while ago was the fact that I, I considered design engineers to be the kind of unsung heroes potentially of the net zero and sustainability um, sort of revolution. Because every time they make a decision, um, it's either negative, neutral or positive in terms of sustainability um, and the net zero uh, move. However, if I, for example, I'm working on a project at the moment, I need to buy some supercapacitors. I won't bore you with the details, but if I check the specifications and price, um, I can probably find five or 10 different brands of supercapacitors that will all be suitable. Only one of them will be ultimately the most sustainable and the most helpful for me on a journey to uh, net zero, um, specifically with scope three, if I'm manufacturing products, uh, if I'm buying in components, manufacturing products and selling them. Uh, so uh, what I did, um, I made contact with the University of Kent and we're working on a project at the moment, um, a sort of collaborative uh, workplace where we're looking at almost like a very, very simple food labeling system. Um, so that in addition to a product data sheet um, and a material safety data sheet, what we're going to try and do is encourage um, component manufacturers to include a sustainability and net zero data sheet. Um, and we're working on a kind of measurement method to help companies do that. So that listening to what Kirsty just said, that may well key into that absolutely perfectly. Um, but we need to cover all bases um, in terms of technology. So um, from motors and drives, fluid power and materials, fastening and joining, tribology, power transmission. Uh, so the only way we can do that realistically is with an open source um, do-it-yourself database. Um, and so that's the software project we're working on at the moment. Um, we hope to have that in place by the summer. Um, we're going to invite every engineering company in the world to present to us what they consider to be their most sustainable technology. Um, and once they've added that to the, data, to the database, give them some tools to actually then start to quantify it. Um, so that eventually design engineers will be able to migrate to the technologies and brands that have proved themselves to be uh, investing in, in, uh, in that sort of journey. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we're up to. <laughs> uh, well, we, we, consider our, we, we consider ourselves to be at the foothills of this. Um, and and, and I've, I won't go into detail, but I had communication with someone at uh, uh, some other sort of government level uh, or representative a little while ago who um, made a very interesting statement, which they considered the work we were doing was um, sort of very limited in value because every company already operates um, a product life cycle analysis process as, uh, as part of what they do. Um, that suggests to me that they were very, very out of touch with the reality of designing a product, building, a, a, assembling a bill of materials, manufacturing it and shipping it. Um, it suggested they had no experience of that whatsoever. So um, I, I, I need to make sure that we uh, sidestep those people and organizations and uh, and just get on with the job um so any if anyone wants to catch up with me at some point uh talk to me meet up um see what we're doing um feel free if anyone's at southern manufacturing um, this week then um, i should be wandering around for a couple of days um and and uh yeah that, that's kind of what we do so i will now stop <laughs> John, thank you very much. It does strike me, Roger and Sam, um, having listened to Kirsty, having listened to John, that this whole issue around starting points about um, common accounting standards and so on is going to be one of the greatest challenges in order to find our way. We have to know A, where we're starting from, B, where we're going, and you know what does the road look like? Sam, what work is the Catapult doing and encouraging on this? 
Yeah, I think the first thing I'd say, I think John and, and Kirsty do an excellent work. And you don't you don't wait for these things to be gifted to you. You've got to get on and work within the environment and drive the change. Which so I commend what's been done. Um the, the catapult is again recognizes this challenge that 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 it's not there's a shortage of standards, but there's a shortage of standardization of, of, of how to report. Certainly, as Roger said, when you get beyond scope one to scope two, and even for you know life cycle analysis, there's very varying sort of databases, lookup tables you can use. Uh, so, so we, we, we've been working with um, BSI, British Standards Institute, and, and a range of interviewing people across a range of sectors across the UK to understand what the challenge looks like, large and small companies, in terms of carbon accounting reporting, and then using that as the effectively requirement set to go and review the standards landscape and see what gaps are there. It might seem a bit abstract, but we are. it's important work trying to understand where we can provide guidance to use existing standards or where new standards are required. So we're just concluding that body of work and going um, the next phase is to either pilot sort of guidance around existing standards or produce a new set. Um, and also we'll start to look at carbon accounting tools that can be used. So it, it's still a medium term game. It's probably, you know, six months away from anything we can pilot and test and a bit a bit longer till we've got standard use. So I think, um, but what one challenge we observe is that for looking at your embodied carbon upstream scope three or your downstream scope three in terms of products and services, Roger discussed, or your life cycle assessment, it's just such a, a wide array of ways in which you can report that. And it's very hard to understand if a product you're buying, how that could be comparing, you're comparing apples and pears largely. Even claims made, if you look at all the claims made by major OEMs producing products that they claim to be net zero, we've probably fixed the global warming problem, which of course we haven't. So there's there's plenty of room for greenwashing in in the the way um, carbon accounting reporting works currently. So we're trying to cut through that to get something that's clear, coherent, no room to hide, and helps businesses understand where they are, where the supply chain are, is, and where their products will be in service. So we're developing that with... Um, UK standards bodies also connecting internationally, and hoping to have some some clearer guidance we can pilot and, and ideally drive market adoption. There can be a role for government there, but we're working with industrial sectors to try and drive drive adoption of those things. Really interesting. I, I, I yeah, I, I was going to ask. I, I don't know whether anybody wants to dip their toe in the water of uh, the shark infested pool that is Brexit, but whether uh, anybody has it. <laughs> Well done, David. Shaking your head there, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, I, Sam, you said you're talking to international bodies. Does that include, obviously, the EU? I mean, do we still have a door open to talk to them? Um, because obviously, our nearest market, we need to have some kind of common understanding. Yeah, there's a door open to talk to them. We're not, we're not inside the door, but the door's open. You know, we, there's conversations. So, absolutely we've got to look at what are you doing and, and and usa and other and other regions and you know if the end the standards that become widely adopted come from there as long as we understand them and we're pioneering the use of those that's fine but you know we're looking to try and play a leading role in, in what those standards look like and making sure they work for uk businesses of different sizes but there isn't i'm, I'm guessing there isn't a, a sort of carbon equivalent or net zero equivalent of the wto the world trading organization um that can can agglomerate all these things and negotiate it are you saying it's individual power blocks talking to each other uh, or is there an overarching um body that will emerge to govern all of this the, there isn't yeah there may be i mean you've got un of course and we've got cop and that's highly political so it does mean that certain nations can slow the the pace of progress perhaps there um there's the world economic forum who've got a number of groups looking at, at this challenge as well um maybe that's yeah it's a large corporate so it's not, not maybe supply chain representative but things can advance at that level as well so there may need to be some there's also nation states looking at almost a defensive position as well around um carbon border adjustments something that's being looked at from a number of different places so market access will become key so there's carbon accounting just for clarity transparency trying to decarbonize our sectors and our global footprints um also to help businesses make informed choices but there is also likely to be an impact on, on international trade. When you start to look at border adjustments, you need to understand what the carbon content looks like. So there's a number of reasons why this has been looked at internationally, some from a progressive and some from maybe a defensive position. And it, it, it is a little complicated currently. But we're trying to plug into those conversations at different at different levels and make sure there's a sensible UK voice. You get things that are, are practical and usable, can inform those international trade 
discussions, but importantly, be able to make informed decisions around the, your supply chain, you know, where, where we source materials from. Ultimately, as it stands, carbon, for some sectors, for some companies, we can see there's an incentive to start moving. There's a, either a risk factor or, or for a customer base that's sensitive to this, but generally, carbon is not priced in. It's not sat there with cost quality delivery yet. Um, and there needs to be some effectively relationship between embodied carbon, some underpinning market for that, and and normal business metrics. So I don't think the, the decarbonization drive can really move at pace and wholesale until there is some market pull, be it carrot or stick, for, for low carbon and some clear transparency standards around how we how we drive those. And there's a number of factors, international groups at a government, governmental, political level, at a World Economic Forum, high level blue chip kind of a business led, and then you've got you know government departments looking at trade across different nations into border trade. Okay, David, welcome, very warm welcome to you, David Seal. Perhaps so you, you've got your hand up. Uh, what would you like to say or ask? Yeah, hi Nick, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think it's very interesting discussion. Uh, just the way of background, I'm a, a chartered engineer and a non-exec director of various SME manufacturing companies. I'm also privileged to be a member of Chapter Zero, which is a fantastic organisation teaching NEDs all about um, net zero. Uh, with great train from people like McKinsey, so we can go into businesses and influence them to make it happen. I, I thought Roger's chat was really, really interesting because I think he hit the nail on the head. Uh, there's a huge discontinuity between the strategic aims that we've got and what we're trying to achieve and what's actually practically uh, going to happen in small businesses. Small businesses, they've got a lot of the other things to worry about to start with before doing this. They know it's the right thing to do, but finding management time and capability is a real issue. Roger picked up about, I think you mentioned procurement being weak. Procurement's basically, you know, getting the stuff in, managing the shortages, that sort of mad panic every day, even trying to do it within an ERP system. Um, and also design where people really aren't thinking about this. They're thinking about product design. One of my businesses does a lot of bespoke design work. It's fantastic, very digital front end. Um, but to get this into the forefront when they look at the capability of the product is a really, really difficult th thing to do. And as a NED, I would love to set or put together with the board a fantastic strategic direction for the business that we could all get in behind and follow and everything fall into place. But that is really, really difficult to do. We have a goal and we think we can do something, but actually putting the strategy together and get people to work the strategy is very, very difficult with all the pr pr pressures I mentioned earlier. So in effect, you end up actually with lots of tactical initiatives that actually if you can put them all together, then you get some sort of benefit at the end of it. And actually in one of the businesses, we have a sort of there's a sort of dichotomy going on between net zero on one hand and sustainability on the other. And sustainability is far easier to do because people understand it. It fits with lean. It's about getting rid of waste. They can visualize the waste. They can see what's going on. And they can think about um, ways of stopping that or changing it and doing things in a different way. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think it needs to be design-led. I think training on some of the basics about procuring responsibility it's okay putting standards together, but getting those people to follow those standards is a difficult thing. You've got to get some consistency into there. Um, one of the things that we're doing in one of our business, one of my businesses, is actually we we brought the younger people in the organisation together, the ones that feel passionately about solving this problem, and giving them a free reign to come up with ways of solving some of the problems and changing things, and let them get on with it. And they come up with lots and lots of small uh, iterative changes which are, we are reaping the benefits of. I think it'd be great for some sort of ready reckoner measurement of net zero that would help us go through these things, but it needs to be easily digestible and get a quick win. Kirsty, it sounds to me like your, your carbon calculator is something that could be in high demand. Is it something that actually transfers? I mean, is what you've created with the University of Birmingham. I know it, it's obviously transfers to your other players in, 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 in your particular sector, but does it transfer elsewhere? Can anybody else adapt it? Yes, with the right help from the University of Birmingham um, is the short answer. Um, 
when we sort of spoke and we developed it, it's it's one of those things that when it's done, you go, actually, that is really simple. We've got these sensors here. We've got those sensors there. We're measuring um, the load speed of that motor. We're measuring this. We're measuring that. Um, we've put it all together. They've calculated everything. And, and we literally have a spreadsheet and we put in the number of sheets, how long it took, and it gives us how many grams were produced. So because it's a case of sensors taking in all the mechanical um, aspects of the machinery from start to finish, that can be simply rolled out to pretty much everybody once you've got them to work out the load factors and everything else. But it's doable, yeah, completely. I mean, I, I hope that you know this has created a bit of traction and uh, some connections on that. Graham, lovely to see you. Graham Cooper, um, you've got your hand up. Uh, what would you like to say? I'd just like to say I've I've been working with um, SME manufacturers over the last year or so, uh, doing energy audits, and I think an awful lot of what's being talked about tonight is absolutely valid, but it's over complex for the position most SMEs are in. They're not ready to grasp the de the detail of carbon accounting but most of them have got huge opportunities to reduce energy consumption by just being more efficient and there isn't a factory i've been around yet where i haven't spotted pretty easily 20 percent of the energy being consumed is wasted the worst i've seen one company was wasting over 50 percent of the energy that they used um now while that's going on SMEs are just not on the same page as everybody on this call. They're not worried about international standards and things like that. Um, so I think an awareness in SMEs is needed first and work on reducing consumption by efficiency because that will reduce the carbon, whatever else they're doing, just by reducing the energy. You know, if you, if you don't use a kilowatt of energy, you don't emit any carbon from it. The other last point is on um, carbon footprinting. I've done one project for an SME who was forward thinking and wanting to know the carbon footprint. And what's being said is absolutely true. The problem is the scope three emissions, getting details about raw materials. But when you search on Google, you can find academic texts and various standards that do actually give you something to estimate it for. And the SME I work with, um, I'll just look at the actual numbers so I don't misquote. The upstream scope three was 86% of their total greenhouse gas. Their own scope one and two was 5.8%. And downstream scope three was a shade over 8%. So that scope three, they can't do very much about, but they need to focus on the scope one and two, which is what they're doing. They can reduce that. Um, and someone made a point about uh, purchasing. What they're doing now is when they come to buy new products, they're asking the companies, can you tell us the greenhouse gas content? And they're using that as a discriminator if they can get it. But most of the big companies won't provide an SME with that sort of data at the moment. So it's pointless worrying about it. Work, work on the energy efficiency and the rest will come later. Just something that uh, Professor Steve Evans said, uh, talking about SMEs, he said, um, make certain that you get things in the right order. Don't start investing in huge numbers of uh, complex plans. Get some quick wins in first, mainly on the things you're talking about, Graham. Get some quick wins on your energy costs and so on. Uh, put some money in your pocket because down the track, you will have to start investing and you need to to know that you're going in the right direction. This issue of design um, that has been mentioned, I want to bring Ram Shankar into the conversation because Ram, you uh, are a, an absolute advocate of getting des product design right um, before you start looking at anything else. Tell us a bit about your philosophy. When we talk about sustainability, my philosophy is sustainability is not ESG. It is not SASB reports or GRI reports. Sustainability is genuinely about protecting the future of this planet. And sustainability by design is where we lead everything from at Equitus. 
So when you design a product right, when you design a process right, and when you design a product or a process with the end user convenience in mind, then you, you gain benefits of sustainability along the product along the product life cycle and across the supply chain now for example the way we do things let's say you start with the design you lightweight it reduce materials reduce components you straight away start aligning your design or your product with one or more un sustainable development goals a lightweight design means responsible production and consumption less materials used if you try and not to use virgin material, if you try and go for repurposed or recycled material, you're again not going back into nature to take more things for our own purposes. When you design something which is really lightweight, what happens is you need less energy to machine the part or make it. And then it's because it's so light, you can transport more of your parts from source to destination for the same fuel burnt, or you burn less fuel to transport X number of parts and so on and so forth. And the entire sustainability cycle from design all the way to end user experience can also be mapped aligned with various UN SDGs. You talk about software, we talk about all these other things that we do. If you create a website, how does how does website design, how do website designers get a sustainability impact? The amount of time it takes a person to navigate to what they want on your website equals the amount of energy they are spending sitting on the laptop, using the router, using everything to get to where they need to. Are you an app designer? The amount of time it takes for somebody to use your app to get to where they need to on the app means that much battery from the mobile phone is going, which has to be plugged in again to be charged. So these are little things that people often aren't thinking about when they talk about ESG reporting metrics and SASB and all that. But sustainability, the real impact is about how do we ensure that the planet is in an inhabitable and hospitable state for the generations that come after us. And for me, the philosophy that the question that drives sustainability at Equitus is how do we make the right thing to do the easiest thing to do? I'll, re I'll, I'll repeat it. How do we make the right thing to do, which is sustainable practices by all 7 billion of us, the easiest thing to do? That's the question that directs us and drives everything we do at Equitus. Yeah, that's it for now. Cheers, Nick. Thanks for that. Ram, as ever, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, Roger. I mean, thank you. Cheers, Roger. You um, you were the one who brought the uh, the design element into the conversation. Uh, just wondering what you thought about what Ram had to say there. Yeah, I thought, man, I've got loads of things that I've just been thinking about listening to all the all the different elements. I'll I'll um, I'll I'll. I'll take the design one first, but just put it in the context a little bit about what we were sort of um, discussing a little earlier. Um, I think that whenever you're doing drivers and Ram's right on this, it, it's usually against drivers and uh, requirements that, that you've defined early in, in your design process. So. Get, getting sustainability, environmental factors into that, I think is all incredibly important. I think it feeds into a sustainability agenda. I think it feeds into a net zero agenda. I think where a lot of SME struggle comes back perhaps to what a couple of the other people were saying is that at the minute we do not have a regulatory framework for net zero at the moment. We have an overarching international an overarching international framework for emissions reporting, which is the greenhouse gas protocol, which everyone is referring to as scope one, scope two and scope three. But that is only a recommendation framework. It's the same way as when the World Health Organization recommends practices around COVID. It's up to governments to then take that and make it regulation in the country that we adhere to. So that, that's one complicated element. And even the SDGs, which I appreciate, Ramla, important they are loose-ish as well in some of their indicators it, it can be hard to nail down so i wonder how businesses find their way to the exact metrics that they're aiming for is is a starting point um, around that um so i i i think with design um i i agree with the ethos i agree with the philosophy around it i think we should be aiming for that again where it comes back to for me is i I, it's not even just SMEs. I even know some of the, the middle tier manufacturers that really struggle for design resource. We, we have skills shortage anyway. 
I, and there's there's just a sort of lack of capability in general around the technical requirements of what we actually need to do on on these things. Um, and I, I think it's a massive massive issue. And yeah, until the market shifts over, I think as what Sam was saying, where being sustainable and uh, more aligned to net zero becomes a competitive advantage, I struggle to see how it's going to flip over against the traditional metrics um, for design um, within there. Um, and I guess just a final note on design, Sam and I lived this in our early days of our careers. When, when we talk about design, people do tend to go towards products. I think maybe in the software domain experience has come into it. I think manufacturing is behind in, in process design on that. And obviously that's a key pathway to building up what would be the scope one, two and three emission of any product that's coming through. Uh, you know, if you choose to source steel from China and run your subcon through Eastern Europe and you're flying it all the way through and using a certain type of resin and carbon fiber, which has to be super chilled, it, it, do you see what I mean? It, it goes beyond the end use product there. You are designing the entire value chain up there. Um, and we really are, I think, short on capability in that area of design, certainly, you know, manufacturing process design. Isn't that where, isn't that where um, carbon, a, a carbon border adjustments will come in, though, Roger? That, that's where the discouragement will be to stop, to stop you ordering your cheap steel, because any embedded carbon that comes in, you'll, you'll have to pay for to encourage uh, using perhaps green steel, if we can get our steel industry greened up in this country? Well, I do I do agree with you completely. And I think the theoretical framework for it is there. I completely agree. But here's, here's the issue. We've still never truly resolved international taxation. Or even when we implemented COVID measures, different people have different ways of testing that goes across borders. You know, it, it's dependent. We are still nation states at the minute that sign into bigger frameworks. And there's a whole lot of political process that has to start feeding down before we get to this standardized system that can go across borders at the moment. So I agree with you, the principles there. Um, that that's a whole piece of work, though, that that, that is going to take quite an intense level of effort up at government level. And um, yeah, and, and sorry, just one last thing, all against the backdrop as well of we haven't yet got a total definition of what net zero as an organization means. You are you are meant to reduce as much as possible and then you can offset the rest. Yeah. But that's like, uh, imagine me saying that we, we could have you pay tax up to 60% and we'd like you to pay as much tax as possible um, and, and you're good for the rest. We're, we're gonna have to get a bit harder and faster really on what, what net zero actually means. And that, I think that will come with regulation in, in different countries. That's really interesting, uh, Roger. Uh, just going back to something that you said around if we can't, define or we can't um, sell the competitive advantage, it's not going to get picked up. We're going to main maintain these traditional practices, um, traditional design methods in your example. Um, this idea of selling something, storytelling, seems to be the thread throughout net zero, regardless of where you are on the, on the journey. So if you're wanting your board to approve some funds for a, for a pilot project, your, your first foray, you need to kind of sell the benefits. If you've already made um, the commitments like Kirsty has, maybe that comes with a slightly higher cost. So you need to then sell that cost to your customers. You need to kind of um, sell the, the, the benefits of net zero. And I would just wonder where this, this element of storytelling comes across um, in, in terms of selling the need to, to become net zero to your board, to your employees, to your shareholders, to your suppliers, to your customers. Um, maybe Kirsty, can you pick that up in terms of how have you sold this to the, the story um, to, to your to your supply chain and to your customers? Um, it's a, it's a, an ongoing process um, for us when we sort of 
had the press go out about we can calculate how many grams of CO2 are produced whenever we polish a sheet of stainless steel or a thousand sheets of stainless steel. For us as a small SME um, in the West Midlands, um, it coincidentally was released on the same day that Otokumpu, one of Europe's largest stainless steel mills, told everybody that they could calculate how many tons of CO2 were produced per ton of stainless steel that they, they built, um, which it was purely coincidental. Um, but since then, they've reached out to us and said, you know, this is great. I mean, we know them, obviously, they're part of the supply chain we work in. Um, and they've run some interesting numbers on the tons of CO2 that a ton of stainless steel produced in China and imported is compared to their leaner, greener steels that they're doing. Um, and again, you know, they're pushing that into the marketplace. It, it's definitely a marathon, um, a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, we need to get the information out there. I think I'm probably boring most people I know on LinkedIn because I think every other post is something about sustainability net zero. Um, we keep talking about it, we're pushing it. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, it's something that people say, oh, that's great. I'm really glad to see you doing that. Um, have we tried to say in that case, can we charge an extra 20 quid a ton? Um, no, we haven't. Will we? No, we won't. Um, should we? Yes. Um, it, it's, it's just something that collaboration is the key. I sit down with other business owners in our industry and this is on our topic. It's in our, our list of topics. It's one of the things we all talk about and we all sit there and share best practice about getting, and I know somebody's just had um, a compressed air audit um, a big, to see if there are any leaks anywhere, if they can improve the air distribution around their factory. Um, and all these little things that we all mention to each other are going to help everybody. But we go back to there not being a framework, there not being um, standards. There's not a tick list you can get from Google. It's all about, somebody said earlier, we're at the foothills. We're developing this as we, we go along. And the more we can talk to each other, the more we can debate this, the more we can share best, best practice, the quicker we're going to get to um, being able to do, making do the right thing, the easiest choice to make, uh, to paraphrase badly, sorry, um, hmm. something Ram said earlier. And have I, you seen, have you made this part of your um, part of your marketing? Have you seen, have you won business off the back of it? Um, yes, we have. Um, but we only started doing it in a, a very short time ago. But we have done. But it's something that um, in our, our sort of marketing strategy, um, we've got a fairly sort of long road on it, a sort of about 18 months. Um, and it's. Uh, going, um, we're going to be more proactive with it from the end of February, um, primarily because we've had other things that we've been focusing on, um, and the same way that we can certify um, the finishes that we produce, we'll be able to certify the um, grams of carbon that are produced at the same time. I want to, uh, we've got about seven minutes left, and there's a very important issue which I'd like to address to Sam. Uh, but before we do that, quick story that Kirsty told during the film was that only by doing this, these calculations with the help of the University of Birmingham did she realise that three quarters of the carbon um, expenditure going into uh, her products uh, actually came from the extraction system, not from the process itself. Uh, so that I thought was a great story because it does tell us that you need to look at everything. Um, the, the, the venting in your factory ceiling, whether it, the vent should be open all the time, all kinds of things like that. Um, the ways in which you can save, uh, as Steve Evans said, put, put a bit of cash back in your pocket first. Sam, this issue of materials, I think, is really important uh, because Paul Cantwell was in the film and uh, he's from National Ma Manufacturing Institute Scotland. 
And he was saying that um, effectively, we're going to be looking at decarbonizing the supply chain. That is going to affect a huge amount of what happens up and down the value chains uh, in the UK. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how you see that happening and how long do you think that process is going to take? Paul's right. You know, we, we see that up to, you know, 95% of, of the footprint, I can't remember someone was saying this already uh, this evening, for particular products that can be in the, embodied in the materials outside of the factory. So that's where the biggest part of the problem lies. And if we don't address that, there's a risk actually, you know, things move, the materials element where the real carbon cost lies, move to higher carbon, lower cost parts of the world. So this comes back to the carbon accounting piece again. So I'm conscious we're talking about the kind of system level changes we need to make here. But I think we've got to have clarity on how you measure embodied carbon through supply chains and being able to equip people with data to make informed choices. You just talk, Nick, you know, Kirsty about examples and making informed choices in your factory. So the, the data showing you things that may be surprising and you can act upon. So we can use, you know, data from existing kind of lookup tables and databases to at least make you make informed choices, understand where the carbon lies in your value chain and start to make choices about that. So some of those you make your hands may be tied. But to, to really address it, Nick, it, uh, we do need to have that transparency, some quantization of standards, which will then start to drive us towards reducing carbon footprint. Because to, to put the green steel infrastructure or even clean steel, you know, low carbon steel, secondary or, or green steel in place in the UK is significant cost and investment. So we need to signal to the markets that that's going to be rewarded to attract the investment. So it does, I think the standards piece underpins all of that, I'm afraid, in terms of energy intensive, capital intensive processes creating raw materials. Um, so that, that's why we keep coming back to the standards piece. But I recognize, you know, there's a risk in me talking about things here that seem a little out of touch for SMEs. So the, the, the message here is that these changes will come. At some point, carbon will be priced in somehow into the markets. There will be greater transparency and be able to act upon that. But I think the key message is, as we've heard from, you know, from some of the speakers today, you can start with the quick wins, start with resource and energy efficiency. You didn't wait until the system things are fixed before you get started. Because if you do get started and get some data around where there are potential savings in your own factory, then you're starting to become sort of data literate, maybe starting to develop some of the capabilities that, that are needed. You know, as Roger's pointed out, those are, are often lacking. So get started with something that pays for itself. It gets you on the journey. Don't wait until the system is fixed. Because if we can start to gather data, make informed decisions in factory, perhaps then start to do the same in your supply chain, you're going to be ahead of the market and better placed when broader standards and market adoption comes in. So start small. Start with something achievable, manageable, and it's got a financial return. And then start to get a better understanding of where you sit, where your supply chain sits and how you can act upon it. Roger, I mean, perhaps some wrapping up thoughts from yourself um, on this this mission that your company is on in trying to help um, SMEs and uh, SME manufacturers start and continue and, and you know, gather speed on their journey to net zero. Yeah, sure. I, I'm, I'm just going to leave with, uh, I'll just mention one final thing about the carbon element as well, about the carbon accounting side of it, that, um, I, again, it comes back a bit to capabilities as well. And it, it, Developing carbon calculators is, is great. Developing standards is great. It's the same, though, as traditional accounting. When you start to get into the, the details of it, you're still going to need some skilled people in your business that are going to be able to do this. For example, any of the categories associated with transportation of goods, there are four different layers, I think, in um, uh, category six, I think, of, of scope three around um uh, what, how you would categorize the emissions associated with something coming into your business, depending on whether it is a tier one supplier, whether you pay for the transport yourself, shove your own van out there. It, 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 you're you're going to need to get under the hood of it. There will be no software that just does it, really, um, in terms of that. So I guess that segues into what I'm trying to do. Um, there are two things that we're doing. We are building our own carbon calculator ourselves, but we're going very niche. We're going purely on product lifecycle analysis um, and honing in largely on industry. And um, we we think that 
um, one of the, the big gaps is that it's not about a generalized DB for certain product types coming out of a certain region of China or Norway or something. We're actually going to have to be able to data share between organizations in our value chain. So that's what we're honing in on um, is life cycle accounting carbon uh, calculator with an ability at different points in the process to invite your supply chain in to put their bespoke emissions at that point. Because the one thing you have to remember is all your scope three is at some point someone else's scope one and two. So they're going to have the driver to, to reduce at that point. Um, and then the second aspect that I'm doing is, um, is more of a broad consultancy one uh, where I'm working with businesses. But um, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm not honing in as much on the numbers. I am using them as indicators. But I, I go in more with a, a program management framework where I look at what capabilities they would need over a 5, 10, 15 year window and, and gently start bringing them down that journey. Uh, we tend to start with the, the, um, the quick wins that you're talking about. So we look at energy efficiency and energy demand reduction usually as years one and two. But I'm really interested in what's their procurement team look like in three years and their engineering design team in five because they're going to have to start thinking about that now. Um, and we discuss a lot around getting graduates on board early on around that, you know, building up that engineering resource over time. So it's, it's kind of exciting too, as well, although challenging. So, yeah. Thanks, Roger. Kirsty, final word from you. I mean, wh where else are you going um, with professional polishing services? What, what's the next step for you in, in trying to achieve carbon neutrality and ultimately net zero? Um, we've, uh, oh, yes, um, um, we, we've got a variety of things on at the moment, um, including um, the first stage of generating our own power, um, which will get us to about 30% um, sustainability by the autumn. Um, then stage two, um, which will be next year, should get us up to about 45. And then the year after, we should be um, at about 60%. So that's where we're focusing as well. Um, and that's a mix of power generation, power storage, um, and as, as well as um, efficiency levels that we found in um, the production, um, sort of internal production system. Um, one of the things we found really useful, which is really, really basic, um, when we were doing the energy audits is we literally walk around every single machine and look at every single plug socket, see if it needs to be on when the operator's on break um, or when he goes home and have sort of like a laminated um, display on the machine. So what can be turned off, what can't. And that's really simple. Well, as often is the case, these things start with uh, little acorns and into mighty oaks of savings they grow. Thank you all very much indeed, our panel, Sam, Roger and Kirsty. Thank you all for joining in and particularly those people who were kind enough to add their contribution to the discussion. Uh, we'll call a halt there. It's two minutes past six. We really appreciate everybody joining us on this Road to Net Zero debate. Um, and again, thanks to the High Value Manufacturing Catapult and Sage for supporting it. Good night, everybody. Thank you. P fascinating discussion could go on for a couple of hours or more, but really appreciate that uh, we have to call a close now. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.